We want to welcome you to our class in General Epistles. We are studying in last time that uh, from introducing the book of 1 Peter. And Hazel says there's no Windows Media. Uh, Ron, if you could give her some help, I would appreciate that since you're... Um, in here, uh, this is March the twelfth, and uh, hope maybe uh, we can get through uh, at least most of the first chapter today of First Peter. Uh, we, as I said, we were introducing the book. Uh, we had looked and notice that it was written to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And we looked at that uh, idea of the scattered, uh, strangers scattered, and Peter uses it as an expression for Christians, but predominantly of Gentile origin. Uh, we stated that uh, from our standpoint, uh, I believe that uh, the epistle would have been dated around 65 A.D. And then uh, it was written from Babylon. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 13 shows us that it was written from there. There are four possible answers we mentioned uh, when last week, and I, as we closed our lesson, uh, as to the answer as to what Babylon is uh, under consideration here, uh, the first would be Babylon in Egypt, uh, then Jerusalem, Rome would be a third choice, uh, as would be seen uh, in its use in Revelation, for example. Uh, Revelation 16, 19, Revelation 17, verse 5 and verse 18, uh, Revelation 18, verse 10 and verse 21, and then Babylon on the Euphrates. So there's the four Babylons that uh, it could have reference to. And uh, I believe, and that didn't come out uh, too good as far as pasting it into uh, the chat room, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to see that. I think Babylon on the Euphrates is the only logical site for the epistle. Um, and some of the reasons <clears throat> that it would be that First, there's no indication in secular history of a church existing in Babylon of Egypt until long after the apostolic age. Uh, also, if you're dealing with Babylon in Egypt, it was not sufficiently well known to be understood without a location being given. Uh, while Babylon on the Euphrates is not that would not be the case with Babylon on the Euphrates, but Babylon in Egypt, just very simply, people did not know about it. And, uh, thus, if he was writing from Babylon in Egypt, he would have mentioned the aspect of it being Egypt. Uh, Babylon in Egypt uh, was northwest and very close to the present site of Cairo. Some have stated uh, Babylon here is used figuratively for Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was never, either in secular or religious writings, figuratively refer referred to as Babylon. And so it would seem highly unlikely that here would be the lone reference to um, uh, Jerusalem as Babylon. It uh, just it does not seem reasonable that uh, Paul or Peter would have been using the term in that way. The third, Rome, 
it was not considered uh, or used figuratively in that way until many years after the writing of this epistle. Uh, it was later on, of course, but at the time uh, as to First Peter, uh, there was not that usage of Babylon being referred to, or Rome being referred to by Babylon. Historically, it was not referred to Babylon until after the writing of Revelation by John. And uh, as we mentioned in the passages uh, there, it uh, was used in that regard by John. But prior to that time, it was not used uh, for Rome. That means we're left with Babylon on the Euphrates. Uh, and a metaphorical use of the term Babylon would not have been in keeping with Peter's very direct, plain style that he was using. Uh, Peter was someone who was very direct, very plain spoken. It would not be in harmony with what he his nature then to turn and use a figurative term as to where he's writing from and say Babylon uh, and using it in that figurative way. Second, nothing in the context warrants the use of uh, a metaphor here. And so uh, generally speaking, you, you take it uh, in the way in which it is set forth unless uh, you take it literally unless there is some reason uh, that warrants the use of it being figurative or using it as a metaphor. Third, it would have been res disrespectful to refer to the, a church as Babylon if the term is being used figuratively here. Uh, he is referring to the church at, at Babylon. Uh, and to use Babylon in relationship to a church, that uh, would not have been very respectful to them. And fourth, Mark's presence with Peter in light of his journeys would indicate Babylon in Asia Minor as well. Now then, the purpose or the, sc <coughs> or the scope of the writing. First, the church to whom Peter wrote was undergoing severe persecutions. Uh, the Neronian persecution against the church began in AD 64 and continued through AD 67. But the Neronian persecution was not over the entire empire, but it was centered in and around Rome. However, the example set by Nero encouraged the enemies of Christians to use the slightest pretext, anything that they could, in effect, to persecute Christians. And also, many individuals would seek to persecute Christians, hoping to gain favor with Nero by uh, that persecution. Uh, and thus, uh, you would see that as well. Uh, and the Neronian persecution... For the first time, Imperial Rome was interested in, in Christianity and in persecuting Christians. It is the first time and one of the most severe and brutal persecutions was initiated by Nero. So this is the time frame in which Peter is writing this. Here's these Christians undergoing this severe persecution. Now then, the reason for that persecution is seen in Nero's having set fire to Rome in 64, or AD 64. Uh, we have the little statement that uh, Nero fiddled while, while Rome burned. In reality, what Nero, had, excuse me, what Nero had envisioned was to build a greater, more glorious Rome. And in order to do that, he was going to have to destroy the present city of Rome. And then he was going to rebuild it greater and more glorious. <clears throat> and so, he sets Rome on fire. 
the people, however, weren't too happy with that. They were upset that uh, he was burning their city. Well, since here's all of the people angry now at this fire in order to divert attention away from himself, and divert really the crime of burning the city away from himself, Nero accused Christians of having started the fire. And so this gives him the opportunity to then persecute or bring about this great persecution of Christians, but it was for the purpose of diverting attention away from himself and onto Christians. They're the ones who uh, bought or started this fire, and not me, is basically the way in which he was acting. And uh, we see a lot of this in First Peter, a great deal of that um, severe persecution. Uh, um, we won't read these passages right now, but let me at least mention First Peter 3, verses 17 and 8, uh, or First Peter 3, 14 through 17, uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 3 and verse 4, and then verses 12 through 19, and then 1 Peter 5 and verse 9. All of these deal a great deal and set forth the severe persecution that the Christians are undergoing at that time. The, in the book uh, 1 Peter, the word suffer, or its equivalent, is found in every chapter. And so we again see the emphasis on suffering within here. We are told, for example, to expect suffering, 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Uh, we are told that suffering is the will of God. Uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 19. Uh, we are told to, that we are to remember the sufferings of Christ. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 11, uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 21 and verse 23, 1 Peter 4, verses 1 and verse 2, and 1 Peter 5 and verse 1. Uh, the value of suffering is dealt with. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and verse 7, 1 Peter 2, verses 19 and 20, 1 Peter 3, verse 14, and then chapter 4 and verse 14. We're told that we should not be troubled by that uh, suffering, but instead we should patiently endure it, 1 Peter 2, verse 23, and 1 Peter 3, 9, and also rejoice in it, 1 Peter 4 and verse 13. Also, in that suffering, we are to recognize that brethren elsewhere suffer also. First uh, Peter 5 and verse 9. We are told, though, on the other hand, do not suffer as an evildoer. We are going to be suffering, but we should not suffer for that pur a purpose. First Peter 2 verse 20 and First Peter 4 and verse 15. And then we are to glorify God in suffering as a Christian, or when we suffer at, for being a Christian, 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. The epistle is outstanding in presenting Christian relationships also. So not only does it deal with persecution, the other aspect is Christian relationships. And you could, in reality, outline the book based upon Christian relationships. Um, first, the Christian relationships to the Lord, chapter 1, verse 13 through chapter 2 and verse 10. Uh, second, to unbelievers, chapter 2 and verse 11 and verse 12. Then to civil rulers, chapter 2, verse 13 through verse 17. Uh, then to ser servants, to masters, uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through verse 25. Then husband, or excuse me, wives, to husbands, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And then husbands, to wives, chapter 3 and verse 7 
and I won't even make any comment about it. It takes him six verses to deal with wives to husbands, and only one husbands to wives. <clears throat> uh, but I didn't say that, of course. Then uh, our relationships one to another, chapter 3, verse 8 through 12. Then our relationship to persecution, uh, chapter 3, verse 13 through chapter 4 and verse 19. Then elders' relationship to the flock, chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Then members' relationship to elders, chapter 5, uh, verses 5 through verse 7. And so that gives a brief illustration of how Peter presents the relationships of Christians to these different categories of individuals and Christian relationships, and in the book is literally filled with those type of Christian relationships. Now then, having introduced the book, let's get into 1 Peter itself. And verse 1, to Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And we're not going to really deal with uh, this verse too much because everything that uh, in the introduction that we've dealt with, uh, we've dealt with everything in this verse in the introduction, let's put it that way. So going on to verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and to obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. First, he deals with the foreknowledge of God. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. The foreknowledge of God deals with the preparations, the plans of God. Uh, that God planned a plan or schemed a scheme even before the world began. And... Again, we can't read all of these verses, but uh, study 1 Peter 1 in verse 20, Romans 8, verse 28, Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5, Ephesians 3 and verse 11. We start beginning to see and get an idea of here's the plans, the preparations of God, the foreknowledge of God, even before the world began. This foreknowledge, though, is not as Calvin teaches, and Calvinism is really uh, warmed over Augustinianism, they taught that there was a predestination or a, foreknow me, a foreknowledge of individuals and that those individuals were predestined to either heaven or to hell based upon the capriciousness of God. Using myself as an illustration in that, it would be God saying that here's Michael Hatcher, that he's going to be born at uh, 19, none of your business, uh, and that he's going to uh, be lost, or God makes the decision, he's going to be saved. Then comes time in which I'm born, I live my life, there is nothing in my life that can change that decision of God that either I am saved or I'm lost. There's nothing that I can do, no action that I can perform, there's nothing whatsoever, that's my state. It's based totally, wholly on the capriciousness of God, his decision either to save me or to, allow, or to cause me to be lost. Nothing that I do. That's not Bible. It presents in reality God as a, a horrible God. That God would predestine individuals to an eternal torment based upon his choice and nothing else. No action upon their part. And they, even if they want to be saved, have no power in the to be saved, that they're going to be lost eternally in hell simply because God chose it that way. That is a, a God that is totally foreign from the Bible. But that's Calvinism or Augustinianism. 
here we have, though, a foreknowledge of God. He is certainly taught in the predestination of God. But when you deal with predestination, you're dealing with, here's the plan that God has set forth to save mankind. It is going to be found in Christ and in the church. Now, sanctification of the Spirit. Here's the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. Sanctification comes from the Greek word uh, hagios, hagiosmos. And that comes from the Greek word hagios. And it means literally to be set apart. Uh, when discussing God, God is holy in an absolute sense, in that he is totally free of sin. There is no sin associated with God that can be associated with God. However, the word is also applied to things. And when it is applied to things, it is dealing with that this thing, whatever it is, is dedicated to God's service. For example, an altar that man would build would be referred to as holy in the sense that it was going to be used for God and for the things of God. That's what it would have been used for. When applied to man, though, this word holy takes on both of these ideas, that free of sin and dedicated to God's service, or he's consecrated to service to God. As Peter is using the term here, sanctification of the Spirit, it would be seen in the act of being that here is someone who is being set apart for God's service. The Spirit does set, up, set us apart for the service of God. Uh, we would see that also in passages such as 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11 and 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. The Spirit, Holy Spirit, sets us apart for holiness that we are free of sin and we are dedicated and consecrated to God. question, though, is... And this is here stating the fact of sanctification of the Spirit. He is not dealing with how he does it so much in that statement. How does he do it? That's the question that needs to be asked. Well, he does it by means of the Word of God. And really, uh, the first chapter of 1 Peter deals with that to a great extent. Uh, look in verses 11 and verse 12 then verses 15 and 16, and then go down to verses 20 and 21, and you'll see that here is the Holy Spirit sanctifying us by the Word of God. And again, Second Peter, the first chapter in verse 21. If we go back to, and looking at the work of the Spirit himself, to John the 16th chapter, verses 8 through verse 11, you'll see that the Spirit's work is that of convicting the world, or of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now then, when we start studying that, we also find in that same context where he says, here's the work of the Spirit, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, he also sets forth how he is going to accomplish it. It's going to be through the Word of God. John 16, verses uh, 12 and 13. And then as you go to Acts, the second, the, the second chapter of Acts, you see the fulfillment of that, how that it's done, how that it is accomplished. Peter was convicting them, the Jews on that occasion, of sin, the sin of crucifying God's Son. He is setting forth for them how they can be righteous by their, upon their faith in Christ, because that's what he is doing, is instilling in them a faith in Christ, and then he tells them their need to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Why is that? Well, the remission of their sins implies the judgment to come. And so the Spirit was accomplishing his work, but he was using the Word of God. Now, that's a very brief overview, and I left a lot of things out that probably need to be said along that line. But I hope through that very short statement you can see Here's the Spirit doing his work, John 16, 8 through 11, as to convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, 
and how he does that by the word of truth, verses 12 and 13 in Acts uh, 2. In this, though, we start seeing man's response as well. Man's response in our obedience and our need for our obedience. The work of the Spirit in sanctifying us cannot. It is impossible for the Spirit to sanctify us without our obedience. And look at uh, even uh, in First Peter, the first chapter and verse 22. Uh, and again, in chapter 4 and verse 17, then John, the 15th chapter and verse 14, Hebrews 8, or excuse me, Hebrews 5, verse 8 and verse 9, that Christ is the author of eternal salvation to those that obey him. Well, thus, man's response in our obedience is absolutely necessary for the Spirit to sanctify us. Then we have the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. And it is through the blood of Christ by which we are saved. Uh, again, verses 8 uh, here in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Uh, also, Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 22, and Hebrews 10, or excuse me, uh, ver chapter 9 and verse 14, all set forth the that we are saved, and it is through the blood of Christ by which we are going to be saved. And Notice that we are going to have our conscience purged from uh, sin, and an evil conscience is purged by the blood of Christ, but it's done in the act of baptism, uh, act of 1 Peter 3 and verse 20 and 21. And so you have elect according to the foreknowledge of God through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, and notice in those three statements you have the Godhead being presented. You have the Father and his foreknowledge. You have Christ and his blood being sprinkled for our sins. And you have our sanctification through the Spirit, or by, uh, sanctification taking place of the Spirit. Uh, so you have, there's the Godhead being presented to us in this introduction to First Peter. Then he wishes grace and peace uh, be multiplied. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Grace means mercy, favor. It is unmerited favor, sometimes we call it. It is by God's grace that we receive the physical necessities of life. Uh, we would see uh, Matthew, the sixth chapter, uh, that God gives unto those who have, uh, God is going to take care of his creation, and us, the physical necessities of life. But here, spiritual is in mind. Here's the spiritual blessing. The result of that grace of God is peace with God through Jesus. Peace is not the absence of alarm. In fact, those to whom Peter is writing to were in, as far as a physical state, a state of alarm. And so it's not the absence of alarm from a physical standpoint, but peace is the beneficial state of man, or as some have put it, God's presence with us. That God is with us, God is caring for us, God's blessings, and we receive those blessings from God. That's peace. These originate with God. Uh, the Father is called the God of grace in 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. Uh, he is also the Father of peace, Hebrews uh, 13 and verse 20. Um, also, that grace comes by or from Jesus. Uh, we would find in John 1 and verse 17. Uh, that we have gr our grace coming from gr Christ. Uh, and then also Christ is that one who gives us peace. Uh, John 14 and verse 27. So when we look at grace and peace, grace is that which is purposed, while peace is the result that we have. 
Mercy is another uh, word for grace. But, uh, for example, in Second John, in verse 3, these two terms are used together, grace, mercy, and peace. In that case, grace is that which is intended, mercy is that which comes forth or is the result of God's grace. It's not the end result, but it's that which God expresses toward man. And then peace would be the end result of grace, mercy, and peace. Now then, in, starting in verse 3 and going through chapter 2 and verse 10, we have the first major section of blessings of Christians. And in verses 3 through verse 5, we have the heavenly hope being presented to us. In verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Here is a heavenly hope that is being uh, set forth for us. This hope is made possible first through God's mercy, second by being born again, and third by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now let's look at each one of these three. It is first by God's mercy. And we're dealing with salvation here. But uh, it is an eternal salvation in heaven that we're dealing with. And that salvation, eternal salvation in heaven cannot be earned by man. This is where the discussion of Paul in Romans the third chapter and verse 27, uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, and Romans 11 and verse 16. Instead, that salvation is by mercy, God's mercy, his grace or his love being bestowed upon us. And we would see uh, passages such as John uh, 3 and verse 16 and 17, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Or Romans 5, verses 8 through verse 11. Uh, Romans 3, uh, verses 20, verse 24. Ephesians 2, verses 1 and then verses 8 and verse 9, that we are saved by grace through faith. Now, Peter here states that it is an abundant mercy. It is abundant in the standpoint that it is available to all men. Uh, Titus 2 and verse 11, The grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men. Uh, and Revelation 22 and verse 17, Whosoever will can come. Uh, then, Thus, that hope is made possible, first, through God's mercy, second, by being born again. Here is man's action in that heavenly hope. Man's action is being born again. Now, that new birth involves two elements. It involves water and spirit, according to John 3 and verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> That water, of course, is the water of baptism, and where we see that in Acts the second chapter in verse thirty-eight, Acts the eighth chapter, verse thirty-six through thirty-eight, where Peter or where Philip and the eunuch go down into the water so that Philip can baptize him. Uh, uh, Acts ten, verse forty-seven and verse forty-eight, Peter commands baptism. Can any man forbid baptism? or water to these individuals. And First Peter 3 and verse 21, 20 and 21, sets forth an illustration. Here's water, and we are saved by baptism, the water of baptism. The Spirit, then, so what, uh, water involves baptism. The Spirit creates in man a new spiritual life, but he does so through the Word of God, and we studied this really in James, when we were studying James in chapter 1 and verse 18, but also 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23 sets forth very beautifully this same aspect. 
Then third, this heavenly hope comes by means of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it is through the resurrection of Christ th that uh, Jesus was shown to be God's Son. Uh, we see in Romans 1 and verse 4 that uh, statement that he's proven, he's shown to be God's Son by the resurrection. And thus, by that resurrection, our Savior. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then... Paul argues, our faith is vain and we are still in our sins in Roman, or 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 17. He says that those who have died in Christ uh, very simply have perished, uh, if that is the case, Roman, or 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 18. But, he says, Christ has been raised from the dead and he is thus the first fruits of uh, of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 and through 23. That sets forth that we likewise will be raised from the dead, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 52 through verse 57. Man was at one time dead in his sins, Colossians 2 and verse 13 and uh, Romans 6. Uh, verse 23 says that uh, the wages of sin is death. But man has been, from that state of death, made alive. Ephesians 2 and verse 1 uh, sets forth that we are made alive. How are we made alive? Well, that's that new birth process by which we are made alive. But it is also we are made alive by the resurrection. Jesus states, in, uh, as recorded by John in John 11 and verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. In Acts 2, verse 20 through 32, uh, Peter sets forth the aspect of Christ's resurrection, and through him uh, we have life. Now then, we portray that an acceptance of that in the act of baptism. Uh, Romans 6, verses 1 through 7, uh, sets forth that portrayal of that hope and that resurrection of Jesus Christ in the act of baptism, in which we are raised to walk in a new life. That new life includes that hope that we have for, an e for eternal life, that which Peter is discussing here in uh, verse 3. Now, in, in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. This living hope here is heaven. And uh, we would uh, mention the aspect of what uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, that if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, uh, that and that uh, what Jesus states to his apostles, that he's going away to prepare a place for us, and if he goes and prepares, he'll come and receive us again. John 14, verses 1 through 3, and also Colossians 1, verses 4 and verse 5. Uh, that living hope is a heavenly hope. And that hope is a hope of ultimate glory, Romans 8 and verse 18. It is described now for us, this heavenly hope, in five ways. First, it is described as incorruptible. Second, it is described as undefiled. Third, it is described as unfading. Fourth, it is described as being reserved in heaven. And fifth, it is described as individual. Notice in the first three of these in particular how that he uses negatives to describe heaven's home. And you might ask the question, why would Peter use negatives to negative terms to describe heaven? Uh, we might not know the total answer to that, but my personal belief is that uh, to depict the beauty of heaven the only way in which he could depict beauty, the beauty of heaven is to contrast it with those things that we know. Uh, 
those things that we are familiar with? How in the world can he depict something of which we have no knowledge of that is so beautiful, that is so wonderful, that there's no way to really express the beauty of it except to contrast it with what we know? Here is what we know. Here is what we are familiar with. And Peter is saying, heaven's not like that. Now, then, let's look at these terms. First, incorruptible. Incorruptible is not liable to decay or not being brought to a worse, a worse state. Uh, go back and read, for example, uh, sometime Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter, and in particular, uh, the first part of that chapter. And look at how... Solomon describes man and man's growing old. What's happening? His body is, de is corrupting. It's decaying. It's going to a worse state. We start having to wear glasses. Our teeth don't we, our, uh, work as well. Our hearing is not as good. We don't sleep as well and so forth and so on. He is setting forth the changes that man undergoes through time. We go to a worse state. We start decaying. Our body does. And, of course, uh, Paul mentions the state which man undergoes then at the resurrection, that we are raised an incorruptible body uh, as opposed to the corruptible body that we have. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 42, uh, verse 44, and then verses 50 through verse 57. Also, in relationship to this incorruptible, ter uh, incorruptible nature, notice what Jesus says in relationship to uh, things on earth and laying up treasures on earth, Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20, and how that we are not to lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt. What is this world? It's always going to a worse state. It's decaying. That's all that this world is. And thus, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Second, he uses the word undefiled. The idea of being undefiled is free from contamination or pollution. And a good illustration of that would be in 2 Peter 2 and verse 20 that here's individuals who have escaped the pollutions of this world. What are the pollutions of this world there? Well, it's sin. And thus, here is a place that is undefiled, that is free of contamination. It is free from the pollution of sin. No sin can enter into heaven. No sin can exist in heaven. And we would also add, since there is no sin that uh, can be in heaven or uh, can enter into it, we would also likewise see that there's no temptation that's going to be there. There's not going to be any temptation to sin, that is, in heaven. Uh, but as we look at our life, everything that we know is associated, there's sin associated with it. We don't know of a place without sin in that standpoint, from a physical standpoint. And thus, here, but here's a place that's not like that. No sin, no defilement in heaven. It's totally free from contamination. Third, unfading. The idea of fading away was used in two ways, or it was applied in two ways. First, it was used to denote a fire, or the quenching of a fire, or the dying out of a fire. Uh, if you ever have watched a fire, it's uh, hot, blazing, but after a while it starts decaying, it starts fading away. It gets lower, the fire gets lower, and finally it goes out. A quenching of the fire, Un it is fading away. It was also used to describe a flower, and that's the term that, or the way in which it's generally presented to us. But a flower that never loses its bloom or its aroma would be unfading. Uh, the flowers that we know of, 
today, they do fade away. They do lose their aroma, their smell. And here is something, though, that is unfading. It never loses that nature, that bloom, the beauty of it, the aroma of it. And so Peter is describing here something that is a symbol of uh, perpetuate, uh, it's everlasting or it's eternal in its nature. It's never going to fade away. It's never going to lose its fire. It's never going to lose that beauty and that aroma that, uh, for those who are there. It's unfading. Fourth, he describes it as being reserved in heaven. The word reserved is to guard or to keep, to preserve, and it's also uh, to give heed to. But here is something that is kept in heaven. Notice that it is not something that we presently possess, though. It is kept in heaven for us, but it's not something we presently have. I now mean, I realize that there are some Christians and, uh, that state that we presently possess eternal life. And I believe that there is a sense in which the Christian does possess eternal life, even now. Not that he cannot lose that eternal life by failing to be obedient. If he sins, he will lose that eternal life. But by being a Christian, we do, in a sense, possess eternal life. But there is that aspect of that it is still something in the future. It is being kept for us, and it is not something that we presently possess. But here is it's re thus reserved in heaven for us. And then the idea that it is for you, thus the individual nature of it. Just as the judgment is going to be individual, that we must each one of us, uh, individual basis, stand before God in judgment, say Corinthians 5 and verse 10, Revelation 20 and verse 12, likewise the reward that we receive is also individual in nature. Uh, go back to, or go to 2 Timothy 2 and verse uh no, 2 Timothy 4 and verses 7 and verse 8. And notice sometime the personal pronouns that, P, that Paul uses here. The I and me, or my. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord... Uh, uh, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. So there's the I, I fought the good fight, I've kept the faith, i finished my course. What's the result? There's laid up for me that crown of life, which the Lord's going to give to me. Now he does that, not to me only, but unto all them, and thus there is that aspect. But notice the, the personal nature that uh, Paul considered that reward. God is going to give this crown of righteousness to me. A beautiful thought of the individual nature of the reward that we're going to receive. Verse 5 then, who are kept by the power of God through faith and to salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept. Kept is a military term that means to protect with a garrison or a military guard. Uh, it would be, and I would liken it maybe to a fort, in which an individual is in the fort, and you have this guard, this fort, around the individual. On all sides, he is being protected. Well, as being used here, who are kept, it suggests a band of soldiers thrown about the faithful to protect and guarantee their safety as long as they remain faith within the stock or the stockade of faith. And you might consider a couple of parallel passages on this. Uh, John the 10th chapter verse 27 through 29 
and Jude verse 1 uh, along that line. So we are being kept by the power of God. And our time is up for this first hour, uh, so we're going to have to stop at this point. Uh, we will then continue in our study here in verse 5 and our next hour.